Welcome to the Hey Chaplain podcast. My name is Jared Altick, and I'm a chaplain with the police department. This podcast is for cops and for everyone who wants an inside look at law enforcement culture, careers, and wellness. On Hey Chaplain, you'll hear from dispatchers and federal agents, sheriffs and U.S. Marshals, as well as the occasional small town police chief or canine handler. From the LAPD to Scotland Yard, the guests on Hey Chaplain share their own wisdom so that police officers everywhere can survive and thrive. I get lots of great opportunities to talk to cops from major metropolitan areas in huge agencies with thousands of sworn officers and giant multi-million dollar budgets. But I don't want to neglect the countless thousands of small agencies in small rural towns across America. So today, we're talking to Sheriff Randy Henderson. Sheriff Henderson is from the small city of Hutchinson out in Reno County, Kansas. The sheriff has been in law enforcement for over 40 years, including time in narcotics before switching from the police department in town to a very rural sheriff's office. Make sure you catch what he says about transitioning from narcotics back to patrol, as well as the story of his signature work in building a new county jail and all of the complicated pieces that went into that achievement. This is a great episode for thinking about a long career in law enforcement and how your career might evolve in unexpected directions. Here's Sheriff Randy Henderson. Hello, Sheriff. How are you? I'm good, Jared. How are you, sir? I'm doing really well. I'm glad to have you on the show today. And so I wanted to talk to you about not just your career, but where your career has been out in in uh, Reno County, Kansas, in Hutchinson. Can you tell me how you got started? Uh, where are you from originally? I'm born and raised in Hutchinson. And I started out, I wanted to be in the, a Marine. Hmm. And I graduated high school when I was 17. I uh, went down that summer and talked to a Marine recruiter, and, uh, man, I was I was ready to go. And the last comment was, I need to get permission from your parents. <laughs> when I pulled in the driveway at home, my mom was standing in the doorway and said, I'm not signing anything. At that time, I had a brother over in Vietnam, mm. and uh, she said, I'm not, you know, having both of you. Uh, going in the service like that. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? And uh, I'd always kind of had an interest in law enforcement. So I enrolled in Hutchinson JUCO uh, with uh, in the police science uh, curriculum at that time and graduated there in 1975. And shortly after that, turned 21 and uh, applied for Hutchinson PD and was hired that uh, just after Christmas. How big, uh, like how many sworn officers was Hutchinson PD at the time? At that time, there was probably around 80. Okay. About 100 now uh, on Hutch PD, but it was about 80, 75, okay. 80. So a town, a town of about 40,000. It was probably about that size back in the it 70s? It was bigger, 45, 46,000. Okay, so maybe slightly smaller now. Right. Okay. And then what did you do in it with the PD? What kind of, just give me the highlights of, of uh, your career with them. Well, I was uh, nine years as a patrol officer before I was uh, promoted to corporal, which at that time was really the best job on the department. You were a crime scene investigator. Uh, so you got a lot of special training with that. Uh, the nights the sergeants were off, you were the sergeant on the street. Uh, we're seeing the shift on the on the on the road, so it was really a, a good assignment. Uh, I spent about three years there before being uh, promoted to sergeant, and shortly after that, uh, I was assigned to the narcotics bureau, and that was in 1988. Came out of there in 1997 uh, after nine years and work in street narcotics. Okay. So in a department the size of Hutchinson at the time, when you were like a corporal, let's say the sergeant was off that night and you were acting sergeant, uh, how many officers would you have under your command? Normally have uh, 
four or five at the most. We worked eight-hour shifts in those days, which have gone to 12 now. Yeah, we had about five officers on the street. You you said you went to narcotics and spent a, a good chunk of your career in narcotics. Now, I'm sure there's some people thinking, now, wait a second, a town of 40,000 people out in the middle of Kansas, what, what narcotics issues did you have in the 80s and 90s? with a population that small. When I went into narcotics, methamphetamine was a big drug of choice. We have uh, Sons of Silence uh, motorcycle group here, and they were responsible in those days for a lot of the methamphetamine trafficking here. Hmm. We're about 45 miles outside of Wichita, so this, we have a lot of transition from Wichita to our community bringing drugs in. We worked methamphetamine, and it was it was. Uh, I had been in there maybe three months, and went up on a wiretap for a meth dealer out of Escondido, California, bringing in large quantities of of meth, and we we were able to take him down, uh, and that virtually did away with our meth uh, for a long time. Oh wow. We uh, the next thing that came in was a crack cocaine with the gangs out of Wichita and even Oklahoma City and Kansas City. They found open territory here in Reno County. And I worked cocaine almost specifically for three, three and a half, four years and took down some major dealers uh, again out of Wichita, Kansas City and Oklahoma City. Okay. Now, I see. I fear that people don't have a clear picture of what Hutchinson is like. I mentioned it was a town of 40,000 people, but for a lot of places, you know, a lot of major metros, a town of 40,000 people is just like a bedroom community. Probably doesn't have sure. any significant infrastructure. It's just, just, you know, residential. But a town out in, the, out in Kansas, you're remote enough that a town of 40,000 has to have its own airport, its own hospital. You know, sure. there, there's a lot of self-sufficiency out there. That That is very accurate. Um, we've got, uh, we are a community that has an abundance of elevators, wheat elevators. Mm-hmm. We are a big farming community, uh, which brings a lot of money into the community. Yeah. Salt uh, mines too, right? Salt mines, which yep. uh, if you use table salt or salt on your roads, uh, when they get slick, they may come from Hutchinson, Kansas. We were known at one time as the salt capital of the world. Uh-huh. And to piggyback off of that, they have taken a lot of those old veins. And a company by the name of Hutchinson Vault and Storage has storage down there for documents. Uh, this The uh, Pentagon has a vault down there. MGM has a vault with the original Gone with the Wind film in it. Yes, I've, and, I've heard that. I've heard that, that the original yeah. master of Star Wars is 600 feet below the it, the ground in Hutchinson, Kansas. Right. So piggybacking off of that, we now have the Underground Salt Museum, which connects to Underground Vault and Storage, which actually gave them an extra way of getting out of that place if something happened. Mm -hmm. So we have a museum down there, and they have, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff down there, and they have a lot of events, uh, like plays and stuff in the mine. Right. Uh, We're home of the uh, National Junior College Basketball Championship. Mm -hmm. Basketball Championship is played here in Hutchinson, Kansas, with teams from all over the country coming in in March. So we got uh, a lot of people coming into the community. Uh, we do have, again, the big farming community, which we get into later, which is part of our drug problem because of the anhydrous. In the later years now, uh, the methamphetamine again came back, and a lot of that was because of meth labs here and, and the availability of the anhydrous. So you did narcotics for, for several years. Let me kind of focus on that for a moment, too. The intensity, the seriousness of those drug crimes. Uh, there's, there's violence associated with it. People die from overdoses. There's, there's all kinds of terrible effects. Uh, tell right. me how that affected you as, as a law enforcement officer to be working narcotics for, for that length of time. 
the real eye opener was for me when the crack cocaine came to town. Uh, I grew up in the south end of town, uh, basically Hispanic, black area of community, and those were my friends. And that at that time was the predominant victim of the crack cocaine era. Hmm. And I would, they were selling crack cocaine out of the house behind where my parents lived. You know, that really hit home. I had the Black Ministerial Society complaining to me, you guys got to do something about this, not knowing that I was laying out in a field across from their house, collecting information to get a drug search warrant and that kind of stuff. Now, now back uh, up there for a second. You, you said laying out in a field. I picture a lot of narcotics you know, certainly in major cities, and a lot of narcotics officers are working out of their car. They're gonna they're gonna watch something from a vehicle, maybe from another building. Uh, you said laying out in a you mean literally laying out in a field? Laying out in a field. I would have a, a guy drive up with me and maybe a partner. He would back into a driveway like he was turning around. We'd jump over a fence and we'd start crawling. Hmm. It was in in this city. But there was open fields behind this crack house, and we'd crawl in there and take photographs and camouflage and everything. You're like duck hunters yeah. out there, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was fun. That was the the kicker. But it was it was very serious business, yeah. and we were able to get get those people. And we did a lot of knock and talks, and and which was kind of funny. I would interview these guys after we arrested them and they'd say, you know, we figured we'd get caught eventually if a crazy white boy was stupid enough to walk into a crack house. This is where I developed the the young man I was telling you earlier that ended up I hired working for me was was a crack dealer. And but he was a hell of a boxer. I mean mm. two Time Golden Glove boxer and and lost all that because of drugs, but and when we talked later, you know, they said, "Were you ever scared of this guy?" I said, "You know, I wasn't afraid of him. In fact, I always figured if he was in a crack house when I was in there, if something happened, he would help me hmm. because that's the kind of relationship that we had. Yeah, and you know, and he was an addict." That was it, and but I never was real concerned with him. In fact, I thought he might help me. So, you know, it's, you kind of build some weird relationships in narcotics. We didn't work a lot of undercover because I grew up in this community, but we worked some. You'd almost have to reserve undercover work for outsiders. Right. Every time I worked undercover, we'd get you know, three, four weeks into it and somebody come along that knew me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or we try to work people that come into the community, but they end up making friends with people in the community that wouldn't know me. So, so that we didn't do a lot of that. Sure. Uh, sure. Well, that's interesting to, to have that tool taken off the table that none right. of your local officers can work undercover because you're never more than two or three degrees of separation from, from right. the people you're observing. So, yeah. We would try to get some young officers that came that were hired that came in from out of town. Sure. That weren't known to, to try to do some things. But probably nine years was too long. Even though we didn't work undercover, you got to live in a lot you didn't live that life, but you were, you know, mixed into it all the time. And I loved it so much, even if I was, if I didn't have anything to do, if my kids weren't with me and, and things like that, I'd go out and check all my crack houses. Hmm. I never put any overtime in for it unless I ended up doing something. But that's just how much I was tied up into that. That's how personal it was to you. It, it was, it was, and, and especially the crack stuff, like I said, was very personal to me. Well, tell me about the negative aspect of that. When it's that personal to you and you're that wrapped up in it, when that period of your career comes to an end, how does that affect you transitioning to the next job? Yeah, you know, there was a couple things. I, I knew I was probably going to be coming out uh, 
and I started looking at my paycheck hmm. because you make a lot of money working overtime in narcotic units. And I thought, I can't live without that money. Hmm. And so I started weaning myself off of that overtime. And that was one of the first things I ever told new hires as a sheriff, live off your base pay. Because the overtime's never guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that can get you in trouble real quick. The other side of that is, uh, you know, when the chief did tell me I was coming out, you know, I said, you know, you're you're screwing up. Uh, you're going to send me. I'm going to get sent to calls, and and people said, you know, this his dog urinated in my yard, and I'm going to say it doesn't make a difference to me because it's not involving drugs. And he laughed and said, I don't think you do that. And it was about a week out of uh, back to patrol that I thought, you know, I'm kind of messed up. I need to sit down and talk to somebody hmm. because I'm not on the right track. I'm not thinking, you know, it was like all of a sudden my kids were grown up and I'm going, I've missed this time. Um, and I don't know that they felt that. I felt it. You know, I would still try to make all their ball games and stuff like that. But there are a lot of Christmases, birthdays and stuff that you miss. Um, but, yeah, it was just I had to I had to seek some guidance because I was not on the right track. Hmm. Now, how long after narcotics did you stay in the PD? Oh, I came out in 1997. Okay. Uh I was promoted shortly after that to a lieutenant uh, and ran a shift of my own until uh, I was took over as sheriff January 2001. There was actually uh, there was another sheriff got in some trouble and they came to you. Can you can you tell me a little bit about your side of that story? You've been 20 plus years in in the PD and now the county needs a sheriff. So, so you can kind of tell me how that happened. Our district attorney, who was a member of the Republican Party, came and he said, I've been approached by some people that would like to see you change parties and run and be our sheriff. And I thought, I know nothing about being a sheriff. <laughs> uh, you know, I know ours walks down the hallway with a coffee cup and talks to a lot of people. I, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> But I thought, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting. If they have enough trust in me to think I can do that. We were housed in the same building as the sheriff's office, so we all knew each other. Okay. Uh, that wasn't an issue. We got along well. And uh, so I said, well, let me think about it. And I went home and I talked to my wife, and she said, you know, I'll support whatever you want to do. And I said, well, there's one more person I want to talk to, and that was my chief. Uh, my chief at that time had come from the sheriff's office. He had been an under sheriff, uh, then took over our 911 dispatch center before becoming our chief. And so I went in and talked to him the next day, and I said, I've been approached about doing this, and I think I would like to, but I won't run against you if you want. And he said, I don't want it, but I will support you and he was the biggest supporter of me. He helped me. He made phone calls to people in front of me and said, we got to get this guy elected. And I went, holy cow. And so I won the appointment that year. Um, a year later, had to run my first election. And that was good for two years to get us back on the four-year cycle. Right. And I only had one opponent. Uh, there was nine of us that put in for the appointment, and I won that. I only had one other opponent the first time I ever ran, and I went four or five other elections unopposed after that. Now, as I understand it, Reno County is profoundly Republican, not just a little bit, but very. And you were a registered Democrat. How, how did they get you to, I mean, how, how were they even okay with that? You know, I think they just looked at the end of individual. They'd seen what I'd done for 25 years in law enforcement, and I guess they liked what they saw. Uh, that was a lot of explaining because there was like 120 uh, Republican chair people that voted for that transition the first time. Mm -hmm. And I talked to about every one of them. And their first question was, why did you change parties? 
And my comment was, well, when I turned 18, my parents were Democrats. I became a Democrat because of that, but I vote for the individual. I don't vote along party lines. I vote for who I think is doing the best job and and can help help, uh, out the community. Mm -hmm. And most of most all of them said, we do that, too. Right. They, yes. <laughs> you know, they weren't going to come in about that publicly, but that, that was their comment. There was good transition between the prior sheriff and his undersheriff and I. We all sat down and talked, and that was that was a blessing for me. You know, they could have left me high and dry, and, sure. and but they didn't, so that made the transition easier. I brought in an undersheriff that, was a police chief in a small community, South Hutchinson, uh, as my undersheriff. And he kind of set things straight when I asked him if he'd be my undersheriff. And he said, I will be your undersheriff as long as you promise me we're always going to do the right thing mm. and not something just to get you elected. So that kind of became our motto. He was very, very intelligent individual as a small community police chief you know you're on patrol one day you're working night shift the next night you're in the city council meeting the next day with the commissioners do going over your budget you do everything so he was a real great mentor to me even though he was my undersheriff he was a mentor to me um, about how to do the right things now one adjustment moving from a city police department to the county sheriff's office is you now have responsibility for the entire county. And as I understand it, Reno County, Hutchinson is two thirds of the population, but a lot of people probably don't appreciate the sheer size of a county in Kansas. I was looking it up. It's like almost 1300 square miles. That's, that's larger than the country of Luxembourg. Yeah. How many deputies did you have on patrol at any given time for for basically 3,000 square kilometers? How, how, how many deputies yeah. do you have working that? Well, let's put a little more into perspective. The city of Hutchinson is about 120 square miles, and we're a 1,250 square mile county. Mm. Um, there are four police agencies that have three, four-man departments. Other than that, it was basically us. And I had one shift, if it was a full shift, was four deputies and a sergeant. <laughs> so, yeah. So that meant... You just have to cover 300 square miles each. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your backup could basically be 30 minutes away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was... We had talked about buying tasers for the... Uh, the jail and the road and the officers on the road, the guys in the jail said, yeah, we'd love to have them. The officers on the road actually came and said, we don't want them. And I said, you're crazy. Why wouldn't you want them? And in our agency, I started everybody out in the jail. You had to work the jail to get promoted to the road. And they said, because in the jail, we learned to talk to people Hmm. And we don't want to lose that ability by having a quick transition to a taser. We went ahead and bought the tasers. Uh, They are used very rarely uh, on the road uh, because the guys have the ability to talk. And that is, you know, uh, my police chief uh, went into our county commission one day with us when we were talking pay raises for our staff and he said you know um sheriff henderson his people do the same job as my officers the difference is my guys have backup two blocks away Hmm. yeah and yeah and you want to pay them three dollars an hour less than my guys and it didn't it didn't go very far with the commission fortunately but I thought, how amazing for him to come in and speak up on our behalf like that. Hmm. They, yeah. the, the compensation has been made now. Well, basically, you have to, to, to keep people right now. Right, right. And, you know, the unfortunate, we're lucky enough, they bumped the guys that were still here 
uh, when they bumped up the new hires. Some agencies aren't doing that, and it's costing employees. Yeah, yeah. Because even if the cost of living is a bit less in some parts of Kansas, I mean, they can get on the Internet and look to see how much they get paid somewhere you else. Bet. And so, yeah. So you were sheriff for 18 years? That's correct. Yeah, we had a terrible jail. Um, it was a dungeon, basically. <laughs> when we had National Institute of Corrections to come in and evaluate it, they had interviewed us. It was built in 1972. And when they walked into the jail, they stopped and they said, when was this built? <laughs> and they said, this is a 1950s design. You were 20 years behind when they designed it. So we had, the, the previous sheriff had been trying to get a new jail. Uh, two of them had and been unsuccessful. We were successful our second time in, in running uh, the election for the new jail. And what we eventually did was we opened it up to the public on Sunday afternoons to come in and tour the, new, the old jail. And every one of them come out and said, that's not fit for, for yeah. an inmate. Yeah. Well, you got to understand my staff lives in that same environment. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, the second vote, we we were very close to winning the first vote, and I'm glad we didn't because where we were going to build that initial jail uh, was landlocked, and we would have been out of room already. Hmm. Uh, but the second election, the fire marshal had come in and threatened to shut us down uh, because of our population. So then we started housing inmates outside other counties. And so we started pointing out to the public, this is how much money you're giving to another county that's leaving Reno County and not coming back. Yeah. And after the tour of the jail, the old jail, they said, you know, we're money ahead to build our own. And so it passed in uh, 2014, we opened up the new Reno County Correctional Facility. And we called it the Correctional Facility as opposed to a jail because we instituted programs in there to help people get back on their feet hmm. and become uh, good citizens of our community. We started drug programs. Uh, again, I hired a young man that I had helped send to prison, and he is my program director, doing an excellent, excellent job. He can talk to those inmates where you and I couldn't. Yeah. And he can say the same thing I did, and they listen to him and not me, and that's that's understandable. Uh, we also have not only developed that, he's got a successful GED program going in there, and have graduated numerous inmates. Uh, we also have mental health in our facility now. Um, you know, it was a shame in about 2012, um, we finally sat down with uh, our mental health facility here. And up to that time, we had minimal contact with them. And what contact we did have wasn't usually positive. And so I had sat down with some people from our mental health facility. And quite frankly, I was one of the worst ones, bad-mouthing these people. Hmm. Um, we sat down and had a real frank discussion in my office. And it was like a light bulb come on. I don't understand what these people can do. Hmm. I think I know in my mind what I think they should be doing. But what legal restraints do they have and, and those kind of things? And from that discussion, uh, we started working more with mental health. In 2013, they gave me a, a mental health provider that worked in my jail. When we opened up the new jail, they were housed. I now have two, where we now have two mental health providers that are housed in our facility. And uh, every inmate that comes in gets a mental health evaluation and the, the right help that they, they need. We now have in our community a eight-bed housing unit uh, where officers can drop off people. Mm. Um, in, instead of taking them to jail, take them there, get them the help they need, get them transitioned back to the street. Do you know off the top of your head how long someone stays in your jail before they are either released or go on to prison? 
length stay is really tricky because when you try to figure it out by days, you've got those inmates that have been in jail three years waiting to go to trial. Yeah. So I, I can't say that. I know we are notorious for being very slow in our court system. Hmm. Okay. And we do have inmates that spend two and three years in our Reno County facility uh, just because they're waiting for a trial. But you do have time then to implement some of these programs. That, yes. that a lot of detention facilities that are shorter term probably don't feel like they have time to make a impact where right. the, well, that's, you know, there's pros and cons to them being there for a long time. <laughs> and so, right. so the longer they're there, the more time you have to, to have them take part in those programs. So, yeah. And that was one of the things that uh, the young man worked on very hard because you'd start your GED, then you'd get released. Yeah. So he worked real hard with the junior college here, Hudson Community College, on making that transition where they could continue with their GED program there. Hmm. And he even got it to the place where initially we had to take the inmate up there for the GED testing and stuff. Now he is qualified to give the testing within the housing units. Oh, excellent. They were under enough stress to be taking a test besides sitting there with a guard outside the door. So we got him certified where he could give the testing right inside our program unit. After 18 years as sheriff, that time came to a conclusion. Uh, what did, what do you do with yourself nowadays? Well, and that was a discussion my wife and I had because she said, you know, you're not good at anything. <laughs> and she Right. I, you know, law enforcement's all I knew. Yeah, I'm a graduate of the FBI National Academy, and I was at a dinner, and uh, the president of the Kansas Chiefs Association came up to me and says, we need to hire a director. And your name came up as a potential director for the Kansas Police Chiefs. And I said, well, I'm, I'm a sheriff. Well, we know that. And so it's kind of funny. They I said, well, let me think about it. And I had been on the board of the Kansas Sheriff's Association for years and, and been their training coordinator. And the uh, executive director for them happened to call me the day I'm driving home from that conference. Hmm. And we talked about some stuff. And I said, hey, well, I got you on the phone. I've been asked to become the director of the Kansas Chiefs. And I said, what do you think? And he said, I think you should take it because you and I have always been able to work together. We've got to get our groups closer together uh, to work better, have joint conferences and stuff. So do it. So I did. And uh, I started that 10 days after I retired. <laughs> I got a call from a relatively new chief shortly after I started. And I think he had probably been told, you know, this this gal's never been in law enforcement. He called and he asked me a question and said, do you have any references for this? And I said, yeah, but I can tell you what I would have done. And he said, well, obviously, you don't know anything about law enforcement. <laughs> and uh, I said, you may want to do your background. And I hung up on him. <laughs> Two days later, he actually called me back. He says, oh, Sheriff, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 40, 43 years, I think I know a little bit. Yeah, you've, you've yeah. been introduced to the subject, yeah. yes. Right. <laughs> well, Sheriff, thank you so much for this. This is so, so good. I appreciate it so much. Do you have any advice, if there's a young patrol officer listening to this, probably working night shift, uh, listening to this podcast, do you have any advice for them? You're going to have ups and downs in this career. Remember the excitement that you had the day you were hired and the day you put on that uniform for the first time and and uh, remember that excitement because there'll be down times that you think, what am I doing in this career? And the grass is not always greener on the other side. Uh, we had a lot of officers leave because they think they uh, can do better or, or have more fun or make more money. And a lot of them come back. Mm, excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sheriff. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. A reoccurring theme that I see with cops who have 30 and 40 year careers is that inevitably their career took them to areas of responsibility that they never expected. There are so many different agencies, specialties, new programs and innovations in law enforcement 
that you can't possibly be prepared for all of them. So I especially appreciated how Sheriff Henderson brought in a mentor to be his undersheriff and then consulted with other people who could help him overcome new challenges. This takes some humility, but it's absolutely critical to be effective in the next phase of your career. I hope this podcast also helps you. I hope it helps you by introducing you to a wide variety of law enforcement topics and personalities to lay the groundwork for whatever your new responsibilities may be. I'm so glad that I got Sheriff Henderson to record this interview with me. He was one of the first recommendations from a Kansas Cops Facebook group where lots of cops enthusiastically recommended him to me as an expert on several topics. If you have ideas for the show or comments or suggestions, feel free to email me at heychaplin44 at gmail.com. There's a link in the show notes. You can also find Hey Chaplin on Facebook and Twitter. Reach out to me. I'd like to meet you. On the next episode of Hey Chaplin. I remember I'm at work as a police officer, spiraling out of control, suicidal, putting myself and everybody I work with in danger. You know, I, I was making traffic stops with doing what we call ghost stops, making traffic stops without calling off on them because I was hoping that I could anger somebody enough, pull them over and get them to shoot and kill me. Yeah. You know, so, I, yeah. you know, my sergeant, he sees like me driving code three, all these places and going to clearing houses by myself, you know, that he all the things you that, shouldn't do all yeah. the things you should never do as a cop. You know, he was like, dude, what is wrong with you? I had an accidental discharge of my shotgun. And that's what set him off. He was like, you're a freaking 11 Bravo. You're a grunt. You've been to war. You knew how to handle a weapon. What the hell is going on with you? Yeah. So I remember he pulled me aside and I just kind of broke down and cried. Cried for the longest I had cried in a long time. The views expressed here are the personal views of the host and our guest and do not necessarily represent the views of any law enforcement agency or its components. If you like this episode, please share it with a cop or someone who loves a cop. Thank you for listening to Hey Chaplin, and as always, pray for peace in our city.